Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Um, it's just gone one o'clock so I'm just going to give everyone a chance to join. Um, do feel free to drop into the Q&A box and say hi. Uh, we've disabled the chat feature as we've discovered it can cause problems for some people using screen readers. Um, so I'm just going to leave it, leave it a few moments for people to arrive and then we'll get started. Okay, I can see, see the numbers going up now. Um, so I'm going to officially start the webinar now. So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is the Higher Education and Public Sector Updates, How Cardiff Metropolitan University Meets Accessibility Targets. Um, my name is Annie Mannion and I'm Digital Communications Manager at AbilityNet and I'll be running you through what you can expect from today's session. Um, so next slide please, Alistair. So just to go through a few bits of housekeeping, um, we've got live captions on the webinar provided by um, My Clear Text. So thank you, Judith, um, who's doing those in the background. You can turn those captions on using the closed caption option on the control panel. And there are also additional live captions via streamtext.net. Um, slides are available at slideshare.net forward slash ability net and also on our website at forward slash Cardiff webinar. Um, if you have any technical issues or you need to leave early, don't worry, you'll receive an email with the recording, the transcript and the slides, and that will come through on Thursday afternoon. And also, depending on how you joined the webinar, you'll find a Q&A window. So if you want to ask the speakers any questions, um, do drop those into the Q&A area and we'll either address them later on or after today's session in a follow up blog on the website. And then finally, um, we have a feedback page, uh, which you'll be directed to at the end, um, which invites you to tell us about any future topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars. So um, yeah, do feel free to fill that in, that would be great. And then um, for those of you who aren't yet familiar with AbilityNet, we support people of any age, living with any disability or impairment to use technology to achieve their goals at home, at work and in education. And we do this by providing specialist advice, um, services, free information resources like this webinar. And I'll share a little bit more about our services at the end of the webinar as well. Okay, great. Um, so today we're joined by Annie Horn, who is Learning Support Manager at Cardiff um, Metropolitan University. And she'll be chatting with Alistair McNaught of McNaught Consultancy. Um, and she's going to be sharing how she helped identify accessibility needs and make changes to the university's processes and procedures to meet the public sector body's accessibility regulations deadline um, in September last year. And then um, AbilityNet Service Delivery Director, um, Amy Lowe, will um, also provide an update on those regulations. And later on, we'll also share some information about our um, new dedicated training course for HE and FE professionals, which is how to deliver and sustain accessible digital learning, and which is coming up on the 17th of March. So just before Amy kicks off today's webinar content, I'm just going to start with a poll. So we're starting to, to hear from a growing number of people who've been monitored as part of the regulations. So we wanted to do a poll on people's readiness. So I'm just going to launch the poll now. Um, so please could you tell us how prepared do you feel for if you were selected for monitoring by government digital service, which is GDS? Uh, are you very confident? We have really embedded this into our practices now and we're striving for ongoing excellence. Are you quite confident? We had an audit and got our statements published in time for the deadline. Are you not that confident? We did some work, but we're not sure how joined up across the institution it was. Or number four, are you really concerned that there would be significant issues found? Um, so depending on how you joined the webinar, you may find you can't see the poll, but you can respond in the Q&A panel. So I'll just leave it a few more moments for anyone who'd like to vote. Uh, just over half of you have voted so far, so I'll just leave it a bit longer. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. So we've got um, nobody <laughs> is very confident. 
unfortunately, we've really embedded this into our practices now and are striving for ongoing excellence. Um, the next is next one is um, quite confident. We had an audit and got our statements published in time for the deadline. That's 32% um, of you said that. Um, not that confident is the, the biggest um, chunk of you, which is 57%. Um, we did some work, but we're not sure how joined up and across the institution it was. And then 12% of you say, we're really concerned um, that, that there'd be significant issues uh, found. So I'm going to stop sharing the poll now. And um, I'm going to hand over to Amy, who's going to share some further information about the GDS monitoring results now. So over to you, Amy. Thanks, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick five minutes on, um, on the regulations before we hear from Annie and Alistair. Um, so we caught up with the monitoring team at GDS, who've been very busy running both automated and manual checks on a wide range of public sector organisations. And we've also, as Annie and our Annie mentioned, been talking to various people who've been subject to the monitoring process. Um, so whilst GDS haven't checked a site with no issues so far, they have come close. Um, and from their perspective, the feedback on what tends to determine whether someone's gonna come through the monitoring really well, tends to include um, that, you know, those that have embedded accessibility in their processes are doing better. Uh, so in, in all processes, um, and also those who are doing regular routine checks. Um, they, they mentioned, you know, the, the initial checks that they're running are not as in-depth as a full audit would discover. So their comment was that in the main, it should be possible through regular checks for organisations to get to these before they do. Um, they did say that those that are using external specialist support services um, are, are doing well and having a third party to help is a good investment if you can manage to find the budget but if you can't then definitely build in doing those checks yourself um, and another um, another positive was people who'd got ahead of the game focusing on getting um, sites such as intranets and third party sites sorted out um, so going on to the next slide and looking at the pitfalls, uh, people who perhaps have done less well in the monitoring might fit some of these categories. Um, obviously those where the, the regulations hadn't been on their radar would understandably have been more likely to have a lot of issues uncovered. Um, another um, sort of group that, that were falling foul a bit were maybe people who'd got themselves organised quite early on when the regulations came out but had seen it as a one shot to meet the deadline and perhaps now have fallen back in standards since they closed the project. Um, again, those that don't have an ongoing built-in process to maintain good accessibility are now having out-of-date accessibility statements or new content that's inaccessible, things like cookie banners and new PDFs and such like. Um, and obviously for those who are only just getting around to internal systems and intranets, uh, often work still needs to be done to make sure their outsourced websites and services are, are, are to the same standard. So. Um, We've got another deadline coming up in June. It's going to be when mobile apps come into scope. Um, so obviously, if you do have any apps that are developed in-house, do make sure they've been checked and tested ahead of the June deadline and have got a compliance statement published for them. Um, you know, in the main, public sector organisations might tend more towards contracting or outsourcing for apps. So pulling together the, the long list of any apps that you're using um, and, and, um, and making sure that you're working through those um, where it's third party apps do start the process of talking to suppliers if you haven't already to check how accessible the apps are and what can be done to fix them and get that statement published by the 23rd of June. Okay. 
So I'll hand over to Alistair and Annie Horn. Thank you very much, Amy. <clears throat> so we've got a series of questions that we've prepared and um, we've, we kind of had a bit of debate about how we're going to present this because we want um, we want it to be about the conversation rather than you know a big question on the screen all the time but we did feel that there was value in introducing the question just momentarily um, and then we'll then I'll stop the screen share for a minute so that it's Annie and me having the conversation that we can see so um, I'd like to introduce Annie. Annie, your chance to wave and <laughs> say hello. hello. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're going to hear a lot about the work that Annie and her colleagues have done. And the starting point that I wanted to kick off with, and we may well have sub questions coming from this and you hopefully will have questions that you want to put into the Q&A chat, uh, the Q&A pane. But I wanted to start with the students because that's ultimately what accessibility is about. So can you tell us about your students and the range of sort of challenges that a typical student would face? Sure. So Cardiff Met is a relatively small university. We've got about 12,000 students spread across just two campuses. Uh, but within that, we offer quite a range of course types. So, for example, we've got students studying programmes that lead to professional accreditation, uh, like allied health professions and teacher training as well as some very practical sports and arts based degrees so when we're considering accessibility we're also having to look at, at this really wide range of material types and ways that students are accessing their information um, i think particularly in normal times you've got a, a substantial mix of face-to-face -face workshop tutorial based sessions alongside digital resources um, people needing to access things whilst they're on placements all over Wales uh, and so forth. <clears throat> so that can be a challenge just in terms of who's using what and when and what works for them. I think we don't particularly have a typical student because everyone brings their own experience yeah. and, and circumstances. But when we're looking at themes, we see students from a variety of backgrounds. So we have a proportionally fairly high number of international students and a high percentage of our Welsh students are from the lowest two quintiles of the Welsh index of multiple deprivation. So practically, this means that they're all dealing with varying levels of previous study and experience. Uh, we've got lots of students who may never have progressed further than GCSE level previously, might have had, you know, maybe quite unpleasant experiences of school education in the typical sense, or certainly have only recently returned to education and are trying to get to grips with what that looks like for them. So what's interesting to me from what you're saying so far, it seems, it seems as if actually accessibility is part of this bigger widening participation, internationalization, um, the, the, the whole gamut of inclusion. Do you, how do you see those fitting together? Well, absolutely. I think it's all about how people feel included in the environment that they're working in. And part of that is being able to to just even find things and know who to speak to. Mm. So I suppose sort of relevant to this is that there's a project alongside our digital accessibility focus project that's been conducted by my colleague, Kerry Morris, and that's looking at our NSS scores amongst students with specific learning difficulties. Mm. And it generated some really useful data on our disclosure rates and differing satisfaction rates between students who are disclosing, who aren't, and what we found is that our neurodiverse learners report lower satisfaction levels than either our non-disabled learners or those with another disability. So we feel like that's really feeding into our accessibility and inclusion work around, well, yeah. why is that? You know, what do we do to address it? Uh, you know, and I know that we're going to go on and talk about our student services, particularly in a minute. But I think it's relevant here that a key challenge is where lots of our students are coming from non-traditional learning backgrounds. They potentially haven't gained much insight into how their, any diagnosis can affect their studies, what support works, how they learn best. So they might not be aware of what they're actually wanting from the environment that mm. they're trying to access. Um, and I think that in that sense, then you can 
you can have some real trepidation and anxiety, particularly if you do encounter barriers, even if it's only a little thing that you can get around really easily. It can have such a massive impact on, on learners' confidence and their faith in us as an institution. So what's fascinating here, Annie, is that actually the point you're making is that accessibility um, is reaching people who would never have considered themselves as um, necessarily having a disability, wouldn't know how to access services and so on. So in a way, you are undisabling people before they, uh, or by taking an accessibility approach, you are undisabling people who potentially didn't even know they had a disability, just knew that they struggled with, you know, with taking information in, um, with reading long texts and so on. Absolutely. And I think it might, I think it works for people who, who will never have a disability potentially, but who are just, I think, unfamiliar with the game, you know, yeah, that process yeah. of who do you go to for what, who makes decisions, how do you even communicate those needs? So if you make things truly accessible to everybody, then you reach everybody, don't you? And everybody has a way of finding their, their Well, tell, tell me, Annie, how you traditionally supported your students and, and what your strengths were. And just give me a say, while you're thinking about the answer, let's, let's just put that on the screen as well so that people can... Um, okay. Have a change of <laughs> screen here <laughs> for a moment. So, you know, how did support traditionally work before the BS bar, you know, public sector bodies, accessibility regulations, etc. And, and where were your strengths in that? Okay. Well, I think like a lot of of institutions, we we have a great student services team, and that includes wellbeing advisory services, uh, my team learning support. And that focuses very much on providing support to students who've disclosed a disability yeah. or those that might be seeking a diagnosis. But alongside that, we have learning and information services, so including the library and a whole raft of resources that are available to the general student population. Uh, we have global engagement directorate that looks after international students. Um, but aside from that, I think actually everybody has a role. In, in supporting students. It's across the whole institution in the shape of academics, personal tutors, technicians, and anyone who has an encounter with a student. But I think for us, certainly our specific traditional way of supporting students was rather individualized. Um, whilst that certainly has its advantages, you know, you can foster closer links with specific academic teams. You can really tailor relevant help. It can pose a slight challenge as well because there can often be a misconception that, well, everything's okay then because yeah. these guys have got what they need. And so what else What else do we need to do? And that's where particularly the data on, on disclosure and so forth was really important because it was trying to make it so that inclusion is relevant to everybody across the institution and everyone has a part to play. Um, I'm trying to think a little bit more about specific support functions. I mean, I think like everyone else, disabled students allowance is key. Yep to providing support, not just in terms of funding, but I find that the regulations are so, or, or are structured in such a way that it, it frames how you deliver support as well. But now that we're getting a chance, partly through a bit of a pedagogical push, partly through the legislative changes and sector changes, but we're getting that push to think more about general resources and general options mm -hmm. that would benefit everybody. It's interesting about the the DSA type model because that I think um, that's obviously in every university, but it kind of skews things in some respects because it it puts the onus on giving the disabled person a ladder to get over a barrier rather than removing the barrier. And I guess that that probably brings us on to the uh, the next question about what what changed as a result of the public sector bodies um, accessibility regulations that came into effect two years ago um, three years ago nearly um, given that you had this traditional model that every other university in the uk has did it did it kind of create a paradigm shift what were the challenges well i think it it possibly reinforced a shift that was happening anyway yeah. Um, you know, lots of people know, but there's lots of DSA sector changes in terms of what support is available yeah. to who and how. And so you were having to think how to bridge that gap anyway. Uh, but it certainly galvanized progress. So it gave a really clear signal that there was work to be done, uh, you know, 
it was a fantastic, it was a really helpful piece of legislation, but it did mean you actually had to do stuff rather than just saying, oh, we should all be more inclusive <laughs> and we'll take our time doing that. Um, I, I mean, in terms of challenges, it was huge, as I'm sure it is for, for all institutions, and especially ones much larger than our own, because the quantity of digital content and the amount of teams involved is, is pretty massive. Uh, and, and I suppose trying to map that out in terms of user journeys, what interacts with what, where it falls down, where it's good and how that can be applied across other areas is, is quite a maze. Uh, so our first challenge was, what is our maze? How do we navigate it at the moment? Yeah. How do we want to be able to navigate it? So within that, you have to look very specifically at what our digital estate is and what people use. So we knew we couldn't wave a magic wand to make everything perfect. So we had to clearly prioritize areas and think about what, what that looked like really around <clears throat> um, who uses things and to what extent they're using them. So for example, we know that our external website is a key source of information for both current and prospective students. So that, that was kind of a clear one. Hmm. Um, and we also knew that our internal staff and student sites were being revamped. So it gave us an opportunity to create some really nice examples of good practice and be able to signpost people to those when we were offering guidance about how to develop their work. Were there impacts on staff? Because in many organisations, you have almost a territory, territoriality builds up around areas of expertise. And I guess the public sector, um, pub, public sector bodies, accessibility regulations, that is a mouthful that put the cat among the pigeons because suddenly, you know, does this belong to the disability support team because they deal with disability issues? Does it belong to the technical team because they understand what the technical standards are? Were there any issues there and what, what were the, how did it play out with staff? Um, so I think absolutely there was a challenge. Uh, and I think it was twofold, both in terms of who was going to be doing work on the project, as well as how to engage people. Um, and I suppose it would help, actually, if I kind of uh, explain a bit more about who this mythical we is that I keep referring to. <laughs> so we didn't have any specific staff or roles allocated to this work. Um, and it came about as a mixture of our Library and Information Services Division and our Student Services and Employability Directorate mm. sort of working together initially and then drawing the project team from across the institution. So identifying key stakeholders from key areas and also identifying where people had interest in it. So for example, we've got a recent uh, School of Technologies and we knew that some of the academic staff within that would have key expertise that could help with it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there was quite a lot of, of research initially, both around what the regulations were and who in the institution would mm would be useful, would, would want to take part, and really trying to convey, again, that principle that this is something that was going to affect everybody. Yeah. So if you can get on board with it now, it gives you a chance to, to push Shape. it in the way that yeah. you want it to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the first things that you, sorry, were you going to make another point there? No, no, uh, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so one of the first things you said a moment ago was, uh, was about mapping out the size and the scale of the issue. So I know for a lot of organizations, a starting point for that is, is probably here, you know, get a technical audit done, find out what the issues are. <clears throat> and um, you had a technical audit done. And um, in what sort of ways did that move you forward? Well, well, that was really interesting for us because it was scheduled right at the start <laughs> of the first lockdown. <clears throat> so suddenly everyone's trying to get used to remote yeah. working. Our yeah. IT team in particular were, were extraordinarily busy trying to sort things. And then here we are saying, oh, hi, can we have uh, IT access across the board for two external users, please? Um, so actually, in fairness to that team, they were great and they really helped us get access to as much as we could. But what happened is that it ended up being myself and the project manager, Sarah Williams, basically sharing our screen for hours while the technical audit was being done and clicking the right buttons when we had to. And whilst that might have seemed a little bit daunting or dry at first, it was incredibly useful because I'm not from a, a typical technical background, so I don't know the ins and outs of coding and so forth. But having that insight into, into the nitty gritty of how the audit 
works yeah. and how things can be embedded into platforms and the impact that has on screen was, was fantastic. And then I think that meant that we could bridge the gap better when we were taking the, the findings out and explaining it to teams and then trying to enhance auditing across the university. It certainly humanizes it, doesn't it? When you see somebody demonstrating a screen reader user attempting to do something that appears to be really simple and it's just impossible. Totally. And, and seeing the bits behind it all. So saying, oh, this tiny little bit of code will yeah. actually make this huge <clears throat> difference. And you think, yeah. oh, well, that's quite an easy fix. We can do yeah. that bit. But then sometimes you might look at others and think, oh, this is much bigger than I thought it would be. Yeah. We need to plan for that. And I found that really useful. And what what was the kind of fallout from that uh, in terms of looking at the technical? Was that something where you had to engage external people or did you have internal skill sets that you, you know, you tried to grow? Um, well, I think a bit of both, really. I mean, obviously, we worked with yourselves and, and Amy around the technical audit and having that done yeah. for a sample of our work. Yeah. But then having seen the process that it went through, I think it helped shape the idea that we need to deliver some really dedicated, specific training to people who are going to go forward and audit their work. So, so we access that and we worked with you guys on that as well. Um, and within it, I think the traffic light system was what was most useful. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So the traffic light system is, it's basically as you go through each check and measure, you get a score and that gives you a, a red, green or an amber code in terms of non-compliant, partially compliant, fully compliant. And that was just such a driver for so many things for, for getting staff engagement with saying, look, this is how you're doing at the moment. Wow, this bit of work is really, really great. Let's try and spread that across to these other areas. And also perhaps to getting a little bit more buy-in from senior management, because I appreciate that they are presented with requests all the yeah. time. But if you give them a table with a load of red boxes and not many green and say, this is how we're meeting legislation, you tend to get a bit more attention than if you, you send them reams and reams of text. Can so I yeah, I think it, sorry. No, no that, that's interesting. The traffic lights bit is really important because I've, I've seen the ability net reports and the, they're very detailed. But one of the things that uh, um, I, I've worked with a number of clients who sometimes say, oh, we do our own auditing and and they bring up something from, I don't know, Site Improve or Wave or any of these many tools. And they've got this list, hundreds and hundreds of things. And they, they look at it and say, I have no idea what any of this means or where to begin. What was the value of the the report you got from AbilityNet in that respect? Did it help you to prioritize saying, OK, we've got 100 things to do, but actually these, these are the key ones. Was there a, a sense for you of those? Totally. So I think being able to see it across the sample as a whole, so you can identify where there are common themes. And yeah. then that's certainly helpful for prioritizing and so forth. Yeah. Um, and I think being able to share that across the teams then, and then people can decide, well, I'll work on this and you work on that. So it simplifies things. And in a way it makes it more accessible, strangely yeah. enough. Yeah. You can pick because, out the bits that you need. Yeah. There, there may be 30 issues of which three are critical issues and would really stop someone and, and maybe 10 are annoying for a user, but they're not a game stopper. So, um, Totally. And what people could do on their platforms within their own teams. Yeah. Who can change these things? You know, if we know that it's a central issue with this platform, then you can kind of push that over there. And so then you're talking to people about the stuff that really matters to them. Let's talk a little bit more about the stuff that really matters to them, because um, quite often people think of audits only in the sense of, you know, it's a technical thing. I. I outsource it to somebody comes in, looks at it, and then I outsource it again internally to the three people in the organization that understand what technical, you know, what the technical coding is and what the standards are. And that's only an element because, as you say, lots of different people have lots of different roles to play. So you, um, you were keen to uh, commission in addition to the audit. Again, let me share my screen um, because you also, uh, commissioned the student journey audits where it wasn't looking at coding and it wasn't looking at compliance in that way it was looking at the experience 
as the student goes through the journeys and you selected several journeys like study skills support library was part of that a prospective student that's coming to look at the university you looked at a sort of student journey through um, disability support you gave some examples of you know this is the kind of thing that they might look at could you go and look through those journeys um, and so a, a number of different very human not technical at all but a student might need to do this a student might need to do that do you want to tell us a little bit about why you looked at that and how how that ad added value to the overall process yeah so i think in terms of value it it gave color to the technical order you know it helped us move away from that impression that you just mentioned of it being an it requirement and you tick some boxes and, and then off you go. And it demonstrated this real practical impact that accessibility has on users. So we wanted to take that forward really because we're trying to consider inclusion across the board. And, and we were anyway with a number of different projects mm. that were going on. And also to try and maybe make it easier for people to engage with. I think if you take something to someone and you say, our technical audit has shown that this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong, then it's potentially just beating people with a stick really. And actually these people are probably trying to be really innovative. They're trying to make their, their work successful. They're trying to help students. So it's about trying to create some guidance and some roots around them, understanding what's useful and why it's useful. So it gave us a bit of evidence to show how everything's really interlinked. And so the digital accessibility aspect and the technological part of that it's just one aspect of a really inclusive education environment, which is mm. ultimately what the legislation is trying to promote. And I'm guessing it also means that whereas a technical audit involves maybe three people in a technical team, um, if you're doing a, some student journeys through three courses, through the library, through the disability support, you're actually pulling in quite a lot of people and giving them feedback on how easily their services are um, uh, available to students and how discoverable they are even. Totally. So, so not just how you find information, but I think how you move through the process of the university. Uh, there's quite often a real separation between schools, units and services, etc. Yeah. But for the student, it's just one entity, even more so if it's inaccessible and you're bouncing back and forth between them. So being able to have that allowed us to to share this information with the people creating the content, but also see how their work interlinks with so many other aspects of the university. You were named the, well, not you personally, uh, but uh, you as a university were, um, you are the Welsh University of the Year for 2021. And part of that was on the basis of your, um, you know, the feedback from students. Um, Given what you've said about accessibility so far and and inclusion, is it just a coincidence that somebody that's that's really been focusing on inclusion and accessibility is also uh, the Welsh University of the Year 2021? Or is there a big overlap there that other other universities might look at? Well, well, I think I think the award, if you like, comes from a combination of lots of people yeah. working really hard in lots of areas. However, I do think that, that we're always listening and we're always trying to develop. So when we're talking about inclusion, we're thinking, well, who are we including yeah. specifically? I mean, you know, who is that? That's your number one question, isn't it? And then really listening to that answer. So even, <clears throat> even in relation to the project I mentioned before about looking at our, NMS, at our NSS scores, yes, they're, they're pretty good, but where are the dips? Yeah. How can we address that? And so constantly striving to to listen to your stakeholders and and make changes and developments to improve their experience is pretty key, I, I think. And then, of course, you add on to that that we are small, it means that we can be agile, we can respond to that pretty quickly. Great. So your rivals should be listening to this. If you know, get accessibility right, <laughs> and you might be Welsh University of the Year or English University of the Year next year. Um, I'm just going to go to the next question, uh, which is really another element. And again, this is that that very broad brush um, sense of accessibility, inclusion, um, merging over into that you know, student satisfaction and so on. You helped us to pilot our accessibility maturity model. 
did that experience shape your thinking at all? Was that useful to your thinking? And if totally, so, I think it helped to, to maybe coalesce some of our ideas and it, it gave more context to the inclusive student journey work that we'd already done. Uh, it gave a bit of scope for development about where we can go once the mere compliance aspect of the project is done. Yeah. And then thinking about how you really embed sustainable inclusive practice into people's work across the university. Uh, and I think a real advantage of it actually is that it gives a very clear framework in a way that people and particularly academics are often very used to working within uh, that you can share with, with people who aren't experts in accessibility, mm. but it gives them a chance to be able to reflect and consider how their practice is included. So everyone's got something to think about, yeah. you know, it's not just... <laughs> inclusion yeah, should be everyone. inclusive shouldn't exactly. it exactly <laughs> that's it it's not just about oh i don't write a website yeah. it's well well let's have a little think about this collective responsibility we have yeah. for our users okay that's great and what's if i look at the next question here what would you count as your key successes over the year it's a journey i'm sure it's a journey in your eyes as in everybody else's but where would you say your milestones would be so far sure well i think and I've got to be honest, I think our big success was keeping going through the, the COVID restrictions. <laughs> we, we had to completely reevaluate how we were approaching the project. We had to totally change up our timescales. Um, so in a way, it's an advantage that we have people working on it from across the university, but it does also mean that everybody else has different responsibilities and, yeah. and day job, if you like. So that sort of, yeah, I think that was really good that we managed to keep going and it shows such a massive dedication to our students that the driving force remained. But I do think a success came from one of the uh, disadvantages, if you like, in that where we had to readjust our expectations of what could be achieved, it kind of gave us the opportunity to step back and think, right, so we might not be perfectly compliant by September. So let's really strive for doing an excellent job yeah. rather than merely a compliant job. And I feel like that's quite a success for us because this is a real driving force for us now and hopefully will lead to, to a more sustainable practice absolutely there are i guess some challenges what would you say your main challenges are and how are you planning to tackle them at the moment well i think in a lot of ways our challenges kind of remain the same as when we started in terms of how do we embed this yeah. but you're just refining the levels at which you're looking at things uh we've been very aware that it's a difficult time for everybody at the moment. So we didn't want to overwhelm staff with saying, you must do this, you must do that. So we didn't think that would really get any buy-in, engagement, that sort of thing. So we're actually going to try and launch quite a lot of resources and training just kind of between Easter and summer at the time when people are looking at their, their module reviews, looking at what adaptations need to be made for the next academic year. So I think presenting this at the right time as things are being built and developed will allow it to be properly embedded and carried mm. forward. We also need to be looking at, um, as Amy was mentioning earlier, quite a rigorous but supportive monitoring system. Yeah. And that that needs to be still agile. So we need it to be pragmatic and cohesive between professional services and academic schools. And then within that, we have to try and think, well, what is the, the shape of HE gonna look like, particularly post COVID? I think there's a lot of talk around what's good, what's been bad, what you take forward and what you don't. But ultimately, it's changed the way that people want to access information and what they're accessing. So I think we have to try and keep I'll keep on our toes a little bit, really, in terms of saying, oh, well, where have these changes occurred? What does that mean in terms of what we need to provide to people and how they're creating that content? And I guess one of the challenges moving forward is that you know, the training, you talk about the training, and I think training is really important, fundamentally important, but it has to be targeted, it has to be role based. So the training you give to a media department is quite possibly very, very different from the training you give to your nursing folk who have a lot of kind of STEM related content with its own challenges. Absolutely. But then I suppose the flip side of that is that you also don't want to lose sight of it being a, a collective effort. Yeah. So what I, th I say this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create resources that are in the same place. So no matter what team you're in, yep. you go into one place to find yep. things. And then that just creates a bit of awareness. You're just within that entire 
atmosphere, aren't you? Of, oh gosh, these guys are looking at that. And that seems vaguely interesting because I saw something about this that might be relevant okay. and you can yeah. dip in and out as you need to, as well as having those very quick, I just need to check how to do this yeah. aspect of things. Yeah. Well, it's something that I'm sure every university is going to be looking at. And, and there's a real value, you know, things like the um, the digital accessibility regulations, JISC mail list and the um, the community practice that's built up on uh, the JISC team site. Uh, they're really good for that. I've got one one final question, Annie, and um, it's probably no surprise to people given where we are at the moment. But it's this question about how have priorities changed as a result of the pandemic? Um, well, I think so. I think I sort of already mentioned a little bit about how we took some time yeah, to, to, reflect. to reflect, yeah, and to think how can we move this forward. I suppose some of our priorities are we have to listen a bit more. We have to see where where things are going to change and where maybe some of the things that have happened now in terms of that flip to blended learning, what of that is going to stay. And so what does that mean? So certainly in terms of lecture capture and, and captioning, I think that's created a huge push in that area, but perhaps to the neglect of some other aspects of work. So I think for us, what we need to do is prioritise listening to our students. How have you found this last academic year? What was actually useful from it? What wasn't useful from it? And then communicating that across teams so that we make sure it's it's a consistent effort to, yeah. to address it. Annie, thank you very much. I think I'm probably joined by another 150 people in the participant pane there who say that's just fascinating. It's been really interesting. And thank you. Thank you for being so open and honest about <laughs> what is a really tricky problem for everybody to, to handle. So thank you very much annie that's thank excellent you. and and well done on welsh university of the year <laughs> thank you <laughs> but yeah um just thank you so much and just so much really positive hard work's been going on so um i'm sure you've all got a lot of questions you'd like to ask annie alistair and amy so if you have a question um do fire away in in the q a window um, there's already quite a few. Um, I doubt we'll manage to cover everything right now, so we'll capture any unanswered questions on our website in the next couple of days, and you'll be sent a link to access them as well. So just looking through the questions now, um, let's start with, there's a question from Mike. Um, he says, was there, was there an issue with budgets and who were the budget holders in terms of getting things done? So we had our project work commissioned, if you like, through a committee within the university and we had an allocated budget within that. Um, as always, there are always budgetary constraints and there's always more that you wish you could purchase. So we just were very, very targeted in the sense of what are the key things that we need? What can we take from that? And how can we expand on it? So I think particularly when we were talking about the traffic light system, um, you know, we worked with you guys and ability net to do that and then we took that forward and we applied that to our own audits that we were doing and and used it in that way um so yes that's how we sort of got around the budgetary issues i suppose is being really focused and then trying to take bits and apply it across the board once we felt confident with a specific way of doing stuff okay and um another attendee asked to what extent are your platforms controlled um I, are your websites, the VLEs, a free-for-all where people can do what they want? Or is there more control around what people can or can't do on those platforms? Um, I think it's somewhere on that spectrum. I think actually what this work showed is that that's a bit of an issue. You know, so who owns what and how do you monitor it without stymieing people's creativity and their understanding of their own content and what's useful, but also having some oversight on it. Um, so actually it's, it's developed some changes within that and, and how we're going forward with it. And that's, that's a whole other project that's kickstarted since ours. What's interesting here, Annie, is that in terms of the maturity model that we were talking about earlier, um, we've got a 
gradation in the maturity model that if somebody has a um, a template if they have an accessible template that is mandatory to use then that gives you a certain tick in terms of accessibility maturity but actually you get bigger ticks for accessibility maturity if you've got a range of templates so as not to stifle creativity or indeed you have ensured that people have the skills to be able to be completely creative but still accessible um, because there is always that tension between giving people ownership and giving people uh, the, you know, the rules they need to be able to use the ownership in a responsible way. Absolutely, I agree. I think that it's very helpful for people to have templates and guidance, but ultimately they need to have the knowledge of why that's there and why they're being asked to do things in a certain way. Um, we've got a question from Katie Hugie, who was actually a, a previous speaker on one of our um, HE public sector update um, webinars. And she said, uh, thank you for a wonderful discussion. I've been asked about the accessibility traffic light score system recently um, from a key stakeholder. They let me know that there used to be an accessibility traffic light scoring system years ago and asked, is it stu still used? So is the traffic light scoring consistent and recognized across third party technical auditors or is there a standard that we can refer to um shall i take that one um so wicag doesn't have traffic lighting uh built in so you know the guidelines um and 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 success criteria are pass or fail but most auditing organizations will as annie said in her talk try and help organizations to prioritize their issues um at ability net our traffic lighting which i think annie kind of went through to some degree it is, or it might have been Alistair, but um, the, the red is something that is a real showstopper that's going to prevent someone from being able to execute the task they're trying to execute. Amber would be something that's highly problematic and, and should be addressed, whereas, uh, um, so, um, sorry, high, medium and low, we, we categorise them into um in our in our full audits so and then there are the nice to haves with the traffic lighting that we used um to train cardiff's auditors you have green for a page that has no issues amber for one that has a certain number of issues and then and then red where where there's a uh, serious issues to address um, there's another question from Samantha. Um, did you have lots of PDFs on your website and how did you tackle moving this content to HTML, for example? I think that's probably a work in progress. I've got to be honest, you know, there's the, uh, the um, issues posed by COVID and everybody having to suddenly adapt what they were doing was an advantage and a disadvantage, you know, where people were rewriting things that they were using straight away. That was a good prompt for them to look at that there and then but some of our more historical stuff that that we would need to go through and that's still a work in progress in terms of reviewing that and and having the time <clears throat> to be able to to help people do that there are also some issues with pdfs in respect of if they are your own if they're in your own ownership their dissertations etc then that's one thing it's very easy to, for you to kind of get those bulk transformed into html or um, any more accessible content the the problem is most of the pdfs a student would use would be perhaps journal articles ebooks etc where you won't necessarily have the the copyright to to do the transformation so you end up stuck between two laws you know the accessibility regs mean they all have to be made accessible to everyone and the copyright regs mean they can only be made accessible to a disabled person and we've had some specific guidance from government digital services saying that in that circumstance, they can't advise you to break the law by overriding the copyright legislation. So they would advise you to um, use the disproportionate burden um, derogation for third party content that you haven't got the, the intellectual property rights to be able to change on bulk for everyone. But a good practice where you can adapt is to move to HTML wherever possible, isn't yep. it? Definitely. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, on, Annie. <laughs> or EPUB. Or EPUB. Don't forget EPUB. 
Um, a question uh, that for, for all of you, I think. Um, the, the Public Sector Bodies Accessibility Regulations Legislation 2018 links to the Equality Act 2010, but is there any other important legislation that would be useful to know about linked to this topic? Well, I would probably go back to the, the point I made just now. There is th that um, rather uncomfortable fit between the, I think it's the 2014 Copyright and Performances um, legislation that does allow you to take any third party content, um, you know, books, journals, etc., and make an accessible version for a disabled person. You don't need to go back to the publisher for that. You can do that. Um, uh, under Section 31B, I think, of that legislation. Um, but it, it only allows you to do that for a disabled person. I think beyond that, Caroline, I think it was Caroline, I, I think the, the key things that you need to know are within the public sector um, legislation, which is focused on making everything accessible. The onus is on the creator to make it accessible. And then there's the Equality Act and the Disability Discrimination Act, which has kind of been absorbed in the Equality Act, where the focus is on if something isn't accessible, the disabled person has a right to have a reasonable adjustment. Between those two, I think, uh, and the copyright bit in the middle, um, I think it covers most of it. Amy or Annie, do you have any other things to add to that that I've missed? No, I, I think you've covered it. And certainly with the public sector regulations, it was, you know, a, a, a groundbreaking moment where it helped the Equality Act to get much sharper teeth in terms of, you know, not making an accessible format is then interpreted to be in a failure to, to make a reasonable adjustment and so would, would uh, come under a discrimination so yeah. I think that that was very positive move forward for disabled people's rights uh, in the digital world. Absolutely. Um, another question for Annie, um, did the relationship between the technology enhanced learning department and the accessibility department um, change or develop during the transformation and if yes then how? So I don't think we have those specific departments and and so what we were doing is we were working with people from from within our library and information services so that includes IT uh, student services and our quality enhancement directorate who um, who look at sort of teaching practice and pedagogical good practice within that and I think it it kind of brought it closer together in a way everybody could see where each other's fields were relevant and and then identify ways to actually work together. I think there's often this idea of, oh, we should all work well together and I'm sure we should collaborate somewhere, but trying to find that particular where can be challenging. So this just gave this great route for us. And I think we both learned from each other about, you know, what people's priorities are and what's useful for them. Um, and then that meant that you could incorporate it in the overall project. And, and a number of other projects are sort of taking off not necessarily off the back of this, but alongside it as a result of a bunch of other things. And again, that's that collaboration across teams and seeing that maybe oh, IT, who you wouldn't necessarily think are relevant to pedagogical practice, perhaps that's where they can feed in with some ideas that they've got and, and vice versa. Okay, um, we've got a few more questions left. Um, how have you found captioning lectures and what do you use? So, so again, that's managed by the QED department. I think it, it poses challenges. I think it poses challenges particularly around the variation. It's not just a simple case of all lectures are delivered remotely and off your pop. So we've got this real uh, difference, I suppose, between synchronous and asynchronous learning. And so our learning is either done live through, through team sessions, for example, we can have you know captions for that and we can direct people in that way and then we also have a lot of our i suppose maybe the more formal lectures the traditional ones where you would sit and very much have information delivered to you they're generally pre-recorded and available on our virtual learning environment through panopto um, and i think captioning with with that is is to be honest is a work in progress because there's different ways that people are recording and there's different means that everyone's using so trying to 
get that message out of perhaps at a time when it's just very busy and, and people are reacting all the time. So, so yes, there's a variety of ways that we're using. Um, personally, when I'm looking at support for students, I quite like captioned or caption ed, which is what I call it, which I know isn't right, but it's caption ed to me. Uh, and I think that works pretty well. Um, and trying to get that balance as well so that, so not only is it accurate, but you're not asking people to, to use a whole bunch of different things. So I think we, we're taking a bit of time to try and get something that's going to apply to everybody and making use of existing tools in the meantime, if that, if that answers your question. Okay, and um, Alistair, I know you, you talked about the um, accessibility maturity model, but um, the, there's somebody who isn't familiar with it yet. So I wondered if you wanted to um, explain that a little bit, bit more. Yes, the Accessibility Maturity Model for Education. There's a link on the uh, website, uh, on the AbilityNet website, which we'll see if we can send out afterwards. And um, this is a model that's been 10 to 12 years, I think, in the making from when it started. But um, I've been doing a lot of work with AbilityNet in the last six months or so, Amy, um, where we've taken what was a conceptual model 10 years ago and we turned it into a very simple model, five stages in it, going from luck, you know, with luck, we won't have to, it won't be noticed that we're not accessible, or we won't have anybody complain through um, the stages like tokenism, standards, um, partnership is the very end one, ownership, in, uh, ownership and then partnership. So a simple model um, that goes through those different stages, um, but we look at the organization, or you can look at yourself, it's, it's a downloadable, kind of top level model, um, you look at the organization through eight different lenses, like who's responsible, what are the, what's the policy framework, where does, um, where does staff skills and expertise sit? So there's eight lenses uh, down the side, five different uh, levels across the top. And, and that's freely available as a download from the AbilityNet website. But we also have much more detailed versions um, that we, we do with paid for training where we've got, in that case, for each of those lenses, you've got maybe 10, you know, six to 10 questions where you look at that they are not kind of just big aspirational things. They're very specific. If you want to prove, you know, your culture, then these are the things you'd look for. And so we look, you know, we have a list of question, the evidence you'd look for to find it. And it's a really effective way of people being able to plot how they're doing on different lenses um, and have different perspectives of looking at their organization and allowing them in a way to, to then map. It gives you that very big sense of we're doing really well on these bits, we're doing really badly on those bits, but we could easily change this to that by, you know, by doing the thing that the, it says it needs in the evidence. So that, that's it basically. We've got uh, we've got one for institution level, and we've got a separate one that works at um, course and module level. And Amy, there's seventeenth. Uh, I think you've got a slide on that, haven't we? Perhaps we ought to get onto the slides, and then we could show. Shall I do that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just just going to say, um, looking at the time, I think we'll have to end the, the questions there. But I know there are some unanswered questions and some people asking for links. So we will share those on the um, the page that you'll be sent uh, after the webinar on Thursday. So if you're okay to um, share the, the PowerPoint presentation again. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I wasn't, I was, I'd gone to the right slide. I just hadn't shared the presentation. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so here's one we prepared earlier, as they say on Blue Peter. Um, just a quick rundown of some of the services that have been discussed today. Um, you can see a link there to our digital accessibility bundle that Cardiff made use of as part of their journey. Uh, there's the link to the accessibility maturity model in the second bullet there, which you can download and have the, uh, have the training up, up and coming on, on the module level one, which isn't included at that link. So that's on the 17th of March. 
Uh, we also offer a range of different types of training, so um, digital, from technical digital accessibility to pedagogical inclusive practice training um, between ourselves and McNaught Consulting. And there's also some expert resources that you can access that can help you with some of the student facing support. Um, someone mentioned in the chat about assistive tech um, and how to identify people's needs. My study, my way is quite useful for that. Apologies, yeah, I'm um, not quite sure why that's um, stopped there. <laughs> it's okay. Um, we also have some um, accessibility training courses. Um, so there's a 10% off discount code available to registrants of our webinars, which is AbilityNet Webinar 1010. And that's available. Um, you can have a look at our training at forward slash training. So um, training that we've got coming up uh, include this week accessibility for copywriters and then how to produce accessible videos on the 4th of March, how to use a screen reader for accessibility testing on the 11th of March, and then um, the course that we mentioned, how to deliver and sustain uh, accessible digital learning, which is on the 17th of March. And then just finally on the, on the last slide, um, you, can, you can sign up to our um, AbilityNet newsletter for the latest announcements in digital accessibility. Um, that's forward slash newsletter. And then um, don't forget about our next free webinars, which are available at forward slash webinars. Um, the next session is on Tuesday, the 2nd of March. So next Tuesday, um, when we're joined by Mar Michael Vermeersh um, at Microsoft, who will be discussing how to do inclusive, accessible recruitment. Um, so yeah, thank you, Annie, Alistair and Amy and everyone that's joined us. Um, we'll be in touch with you soon. And please do fill out the feedback form that will appear at the end of the webinar. So. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.